The year, 1939. Fascism had come to Germany. What started off as a national goal to make Germany great again was fast becoming a nightmare. In today's episode, we are covering the prophecy of Daniel 2 and the courage of one man who worked from within to tell Adolf's troops that they were not going to win this war, all using the power of Daniel 2. True story. Imagine a quaint little village in Germany. The fields oh so serene, the people quite civilized until the clues dawn on you that this was Nazi Germany. The whole nation had united under a singular purpose, which was to reduce rampant unemployment and to make Germany great. But the spirit of nationalism was fast becoming fanatical. Enter Franz Hazel and his wife, Helen. They were Christians living in a time of bigotry. They could see their neighbors buying into the propaganda, and even their sons, through his daily exposure to school, was sharing the vision. And soon, a package was delivered at the door. It was the note that Franz had dreaded. He was being drafted into Hitler's army. Now, Franz had no choice. It was either to be shot then and there in the square or to be drafted and rely on the grace of God. This Franz did, and Providence assigned him in a company 699, which was basically a group of bridge builders who had to go into enemy lines whenever they advanced, basically the first Germans in every enemy territory. So as you can imagine, the average lifespan of them were not very long. But God was with him. And Franz was a man who went through the entire World War II without firing a single shot. This was basically the German version of Mel Gibson's movie, Hacksaw Ridge. I don't know if you've seen it. So I tell Mel Gibson to buy the rights to this story. Perhaps he can make another movie and call it Hacksaw Bridge because they were bridge builders. And through a series of providential events, Franz was actually promoted to private first class. You can imagine the irony of this because he was promoted for being a good influence to his moral soldiers. So can you imagine the higher ups in Germany thought it was important to enforce morals? And because of his promotion, he was allowed to carry instead of his heavy rifle, a little revolver hoisted on the side of his hip. And because he had served in World War I, he had his own demons, his own temptations. To avoid the temptation of shooting another man, Franz did something drastic. He took out his revolver and chucked it into the river. And for the rest of the war, he carried around a fake block of wood, something no one could know about. So Franz soon had a reputation around camp for being the Bible man. And the seeds that he sown eventually produced fruits. People were interested in the Bible. And finally, he had the chance of going into the captain of his troop's tent to explain to him what the Bible was all about. Using this opportunity, Franz presented to him the prophecy of Daniel 2. So let's get right into what Daniel 2 was all about. So, in Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He was sitting in his bed thinking about what would come to pass after him when God answered him through a vision. But when Nebuchadnezzar woke up, for the life of him, he could not remember the contents of this dream, which greatly frustrated him. So he called together all the wise men of his realm, which to him were the sorcerers, the wizards, the snake charmers, and also four wise men of Hebrew descent who were servants of the Most High. So God used this opportunity to prove the foolishness of all the false prophets because none other than Daniel knew the contents of this vision, let alone its interpretation. Starting in verse 31, we get to behold the contents of this dream. Thou king sawest, and behold a great image. This image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form of thee was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, and his legs of iron, and his feet part iron and part clay. 
And thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hand, which smelt the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them into pieces. And Daniel goes on to explain this. He tells King Nebuchadnezzar that thou art this head of gold in verse 38. But the glory of Babylon, which is the all of nations, would eventually pass away and be replaced by an inferior kingdom, according to verse 39. And then afterwards, a third kingdom would rule all the world. Well, all the known world at their time. Now, looking back into history, we know that hindsight is 2020. We know that Babylon would be replaced by Persia, represented by the silver kingdom of the chest and arms of the great statue. The two lines of kings, the Medes and the Persians, would rule the Achaemenid kingdom, starting with Cyrus the Great, which is named by name in the Bible according to Isaiah 45, 1. That's awfully specific. And after the Persians is Greece. Alexander the Great came and conquered and took over the known world in 336 BC and then died in a drunken brawl shortly after at age 32. But hey, prophecy was fulfilled. And then the fourth kingdom, as depicted in verse 40, which had the strength of iron, would be none other than Rome, which replaced the Grecian kingdom. All roads led to Rome. The strength of iron can be seen in the speed of their conquest and also the power they had over all their nations. And also slavery was at an all-time high with the Romans. Now, a serious Bible student would wonder, why are the metals becoming more and more debased? If Rome represented the strength of iron, which is military might, then what is Babylon's strength? What is the strength of gold? This had to do with the true strength of nations, which is the strength of God. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar eventually repented. He worshipped the God of the Most High. Even the kings of Persia, after resisting God for about 21 days, eventually allowed the Jews to go back and rebuild their temple, all in Persian dime. But then came the pride of the Grecian kingdoms, which is philosophy, never again to acknowledge the might of God. And finally was Rome. They crucified Jesus the Savior and threw Christians into the pit of gladiators all for sport. But here is where the imagery really gets interesting. Divine inspiration, instead of predicting a fifth, a sixth kingdom, said that Rome, this iron, would continue down through the statue until the end of time. That it would disperse into a feat of iron and clay. And if you really think about it critically, Rome never actually goes away. It transformed itself by becoming Christian, but it continued to rule over the realms of the kings through the Holy Roman Catholic Church through papacy. The supremacy of the Roman Church was undisputed throughout the Middle Ages, all the way until the French Revolution. And when the old Rome disintegrated, it disintegrated into the 10 tribes of Europe that represent the countries of today, representing the 10 toes on the feet. And all the languages have their root in Latin in Europe, which was the official language of Rome. Now listen to the accuracy of these two verses. Verse 42 says, and as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron does not mix with clay. Now I challenge you to find any other book that can predict this to the level of accuracy. But the overarching theme is this. One day, all of this will go away. The nations are not actually becoming more and more enlightened, but actually more and more debased. And when Jesus ascended after his crucifixion, he promised that he would return to put an end to sin. So then, if God is in control, why is it that we feel like we need to use our voting power to voting a ruler that could usher in the end? Why would we need to settle or compromise our Christian values? 
I don't know about you, but the last time I checked, it was this pesky thing called the Antichrist who would have the support of the people in the last days. And it is the same Antichrist which Paul says was already at work in his time, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.7. When this entity is allowed to work miracles and lying wonders, it is him who will have the support of the people, the unity of state and church. In fact, it is actually a democratic power that is being described in Revelation 13, 14, where he is saying to the people who dwell on the earth that they should be making an image to the beast. The book of Daniel and Revelation are open books. We should allow the simple interpretation of prophecy to settle into us as truth. But if we do not know even what the scriptures say, then how can we defend against this radicalized version of Christianity? How can we help those who have good intentions but are being blown about by every doctrine? Now, going back to our friend Franz, who is basically right now in the lion's den. He concluded his prophecy presentation by telling the captain that, you see the events in history have been proven true over and over again. You see how the toes of iron and clay would never be able to mingle and mix together ever again. Therefore, the fur is fighting a war that he cannot win. We are fighting a losing battle dead silence. Franz probably thought he was going to be shot right then and there. But to his surprise, the captain said, I'll get back to you about this later. And within three days, the captain came and talked to him privately and said, don't mention a word of this to anyone. But from now on, we'll only operate a third of our vehicles. We'll store the extra gasoline rations so that when this war is lost, will have enough to be able to make our way back home. And because Franz was faithful to God, God was faithful to him. At the end of the war, even though they were very far away from home, they were able to make it back home and not end up as Russian prisoners of war, but back to the American side. In every time and every place, God has sent his people to be messengers of truth and to save lives. God needs more men and women who will take Jesus as their example and stand steadfast in principles, not compromising on a single item. Franz's faith was not something that materialized overnight. He had a living relationship with God long before the war. He put in the preparation. He took the time to study the Bible and the prophecies, which then settled into him as truth, as a living testimony. And if you enjoyed learning about the true story of Franz Hazel, I'm going to link a book about him down below. And like and subscribe because this prophecy is continuing. Daniel 2 is just a start and we'll see from simplistic interpretation how the rest of Daniel all matches up.